All right, I think we can get started. Welcome to Club Ed Med Conversations. My name is Bernie Crespi. I'll be the host for today. The goal of Club Ed Med Conversations is to connect the evolutionary medicine community and share exciting new research. We try to make this as informal as possible with an emphasis on discussion and presentation of different perspectives. Club of Med is organized and sponsored by the International Society for Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health. If you're not a member, you should uh, become one. Uh, if you've lapsed, you should renew your membership. And please remember to submit your brilliant work to uh, the Society's journal, Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health. Club of Med is also organized by 10, count them, evolutionary medicine centers and programs, including the most recent ones in uh, Brazil and in, in Germany and at Vanderbilt University uh, in the USA. Please participate in the conversations. We'll have about a 30 minute uh, talk by the speaker. And during that time, you can post questions and ideas in the uh, chat box. And then after the talk, you should also feel free we encourage you to raise your hand uh, virtually to ask a question. We will call on you. Also, feel free to tweet. Uh, Johnny will paste details of uh, the various evolutionary medicine centers in the chat. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Martin Sikora from the University of Copenhagen who will be speaking to us on pathogens through space and time, lessons from high throughput screening for ancient pathogen DNA. All yours, Martin. Perfect, thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction. Can anyone hear me? All good? Yeah, Great. all good. Okay, then I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, and then go to full screen. Okay. Does that work? Yep. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. It's a it's a it's a real pleasure. Um. Yeah. So uh, my name is Martin. Uh, I am uh, at Globe Institute Copenhagen, and today what I'm going to talk about. Uh, hope to have some nice discussion after that. Is is some of our recent work uh, on on pathogens, ancient pathogen DNA. So I think if you've ever seen one of our works before in Copenhagen, we are, yeah, our 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 deal is ancient DNA. So what we're really doing a lot of is is, is sequencing a lot of ancient uh, uh, genomes from, from humans uh, and the, yeah, with the idea and the hope that we can learn something exciting about, about human history from these uh, ancient, ancient sequences. So what I'm going to present today is mainly some work that uh, we we published a preprint a few months back now. So that's currently in in uh, in revision. So I'm going to show a little bit of updated results from that. Um, but I want to start with a, sort of a, a, a short overview background on 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 the topic and and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, yeah. So if we think about disease outbreaks, uh, epidemics. Uh, evidently, this have had a massive impact on on human populations. This is just one of these examples of a timeline uh, of ancient uh, disease epidemics in human history. So you can see, this is just in recorded history. So it starts about 1000 BC, and you can see there are many, many of these recorded ones. But if you look closely, you can also see that many of these, as you might expect, because it's just recorded from from the written uh, 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 written record that they would be suspected, right? So here in the Cyprian plague, suspected to be either smallpox or measles, the Antonin plague, suspected to be smallpox. Oh, sorry, the phone is ringing here on the side. Let me just quickly.
All right, sorry about that interruption. That was perfect timing, of course. Okay, let's get back to it. Uh, yes, yeah, so so yeah, I mean, obviously, human uh, human history is, is is has been shaped by these disease outbreaks, but we you know we don't really know that much about what caused particular outbreaks, where they first appeared. Particularly if we go back after the written record, but there's really nothing known uh, from the written written records, obviously. So oops, let me see. Yeah. So this is basically where we come in, where this this exciting new field of ancient pathogen genomics comes in, because here uh, this is really the first time we can we can use these new molecular tools to try to learn something about uh, ancient diseases, pathogens. Just based on purely on molecular data, so so we can recover DNA from these ancient pathogens. And if you want to talk about what kind of uh, questions we want to answer there, so might like group them into two different types. So one of them is uh, what I've shown here, which you might want to call uh, something like genomic uh, paleoepidemiology. So this is really the map making process that we're still currently in. So it's it's this the basic questions of where and when did particular pathogens originate. How did they spread? Why? Where did they come from? And so on. So this is like the classic um, ancient DNA part that we've previously done in humans, and now we've extended this to 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 the associated pathogens. But what is really cool about ancient pathogen DNA is that we also, because we are recovering in the best circumstances entire genomes of these of these bugs, so we can actually also ask some more interesting questions about uh, evolution of the genomes, genome evolution. So we can actually trace through time how particular pathogens evolved like which mutations have happened how did they sort of react to uh, exposure to the human immune system for example sort of this uh, race between host and pathogens so those are kind of the two types of questions we we might be interested in today it's going to be mainly focused on the on the on the first question so i'm going to mainly talk about this map making process and 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 and, and trying to map out when where and how particular pathogens were around but you know the other part is equally if not more exciting of course so when we look at a timeline of uh, sort of some milestones in ancient pathogen genomics uh, as i said our uh, our institute we're really uh, very much into uh, ancient dna and our field is quite young so we have only been around since 1984, when the first ancient DNA sequence was published. Uh, and it took about 10 years before the first ancient pathogen DNA was amplified. So this was some studies on, on tuberculosis. And back then, of course, with the old methods of PCR amplification, quite tedious and, and very, very difficult to um, authenticate. And then finally, in 2011, so, so quite a bit later, we, we got the first complete ancient bacterial genome. Uh, and so that was published by our colleagues in, in in Leipzig, Kristen Bosendal, and as as it is, uh, it obviously was about uh, one of the sort of most uh, famous and, and 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 devastating diseases in history, sort of Black Death, uh, the plague. And so, what they did back then is that they extracted DNA from some, from skeletons from these uh, plague pits in East Smithfield in London, and could recover a full Yersinia pestis genome. That actually, uh, let me just put this smaller here. Yes, uh, that afterwards, when they put the, the entire genomic information on a phylogenetic tree, it turns out it fell really here at the base of, of this sort of diversification of some of the more recent uh, still around uh, uh, plague diversity today. So it was basically an ancestral uh, position to present day diversity of these green, green strains here. So that was in 2011. Um, interesting side bit here is that uh, the first ancient human genome was actually sequenced a year before even so it's you, know, you might think that's quite surprising because it's actually the human genome is obviously quite a bit of a larger place than than an ancient bacterial genome but the reason for this is quite quite simple it's because we are really when we look for ancient pathogen dna we're really looking for for the classical needle in the haystack so this is just an illustration to show you what uh the kinds of DNA we can expect when we take a bone or a tooth or whatever material we're using, and we just extract DNA and we sequence that. So we get this essentially this soup of many, many different molecules. A lot of it, hopefully, if we're interested in ancient humans, is uh, the blue uh, bits is ancient human DNA. There will be some modern human DNA con uh, contamination, which is uh, the, the sort of these red things here. And then usually most 
is what you might call environmental DNA contamination. So it's really just uh, yeah, DNA from any any organisms that were in the soil, on the bones, on the teeth after the individual died. Uh, and so that's often, if not most of the time, yeah, the, the sort of most abundant part of, of, of that metagenomic soup that we're sequencing. But ever so often we're lucky and we find a few molecules of this ancient pathogen DNA, DNA but usually it's a small fraction of that total DNA because it's kind of, yeah, if you think about it, if in a, in a modern context, if we want to sequence uh, uh, an infection, it's kind of a very indirect way. We, you know, we're waiting for like 3000 years until we, we dig out a tooth or a bone and uh, we sequence the whole thing. And maybe if we're lucky, get access to some bloodstream DNA that some of it might be pathogen DNA. So you can imagine it is not, not a lot. So normally we, we get on the order of maybe one in a hundred thousand, one in a million molecules that are actually unique, uh, authenticated ancient pathogen DNA molecules. So it is an expensive, you know, difficult uh, uh, endeavor, but nevertheless, we have been quite successful, meaning we as a field in it. Um, we're still not in the kind of uh, ranges that uh, ancient human DNA is now, where we actually have uh, just last year, I think, passed the 10,000 ancient human genomes uh, uh, line. Uh, so this is from 2021. So in, in in that particular time, yeah, you can see here this it's, it's not, not looking particularly nice, but but just to give you an idea of where uh, these pathogen genomes are from, and it's on the order of 270. So today maybe we have like three, four hundred maximum cases of ancient pathogens uh, that have been published, and usually these studies are essentially focused on individual diseases. So a lot of these 270 will be plague because plague has been a very big focal point. So there's many, many studies on, on plague from, from, you know, starting from the Neolithic to the present day. Uh, there are some other ones like tuberculosis. Uh, so the, 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 the classic ones you might imagine people are interested in. But by and large, all these studies, what they have in common is that they focus on a particular disease in a particular time period in a particular area and then really uh, try to reconstruct sort of the, the history of that disease through uh, deep sampling. But what we were actually wondering is what else is out there? So what if we actually to a different approach? We're not going to try in most cases to, to, to really dig deep into a particular disease and, and you know, try to enrich and so on to really get high quality genomes of, of a particular species, but rather we want to use a data set that we have where we have actually access to a large number of samples across space and time uh, combined with some sort of modern ways of, of um, computationally screening for ancient pathogen DNA to really just map out what is there. So, and that means we want to go really, really low in terms of abundances. We want to be able to say, even if we have just 50 or 100 reads from a particular disease, we, we're not going to be able to do phylogenetic reconstruction with that, but what we can do is use it in our map making. So we can actually say at this place, at this time, Yersinia pestis was present, for example. So if we can do this for, for many, many species, we can sort of get an idea of just in general, what do you expect to find when you do this, uh, this kind of study? And also more practically uh, across a wide range of different uh, species and different diseases, where and when did they first, do we first observe them and how might they have spread uh, and so on. So this is really the, the 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 sort of the idea or the 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 uh, the aim of 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 this study that we've uh, well, we have published a preprint uh, a couple of months ago. Okay, now in order to do that, we need some efficient way to actually find in this soup of of, of ancient sequencing data the the DNA that is really authentically originating from bloodstream infections from ancient microbial DNA that was present in the individual and not something else that might have been coming afterwards. And so the way that we do that is uh, we have developed this uh, uh, screening workflow, which I'm just very briefly go through. Essentially what it's doing is we take our raw sequencing reads. And again, this is everything uh, that, that comes out, metagenomic sequencing of a particular ancient sample. And then the first thing we do is uh, uh, try for each of these reads uh, get it sort of the best idea of where it's coming from in a sense of a metagenomic classification. So we really just quickly sort out those reads into different bins based on the on the level of genus. So we have, for example, here three different genuses, A, B, and C. Um, so, so the first step is metagenomic classification. We have reads for genus A, genus B, genus C. And then once we have done this sorting within that genus, we take 
individual reference genome from a particular species and then map all of these reads in parallel to all these different uh, references within a genome. And the reason we're doing that is basically, you know, this is kind of a hypothetical scenario. Let's say we have a, a, a pathogen DNA from an unknown species or unknown lineage X in our sample. Uh, so we don't have, obviously, this particular uh, reference genome, but we might have a reasonably closely related uh, reference genome A1. Then in the same genus, we have one that is slightly more distant, A2, and then we have a completely separate genus, B1 and B2. So we could, in principle, map everything uh, against everything, but that's just computation to expenses, which is why we do this pre-sorting into A and B, and then we actually map within that genus against all of them. And then we map, the reason we're mapping is because we need to map to, to be able to authenticate our DNA. So we get these different uh, metrics that we have, you have to use to distinguish modern from ancient, uh, contamination from, from, from different sources from, from real DNA, real ancient pathogen DNA. The way we do that is with uh, sort of three different metrics. So we want to look at similarity to the reference genome. So the, the closer our uh, unknown species reads are to a particular uh, uh, reference genome, the more likely it's actually that the, the, the sequencing reads derive from, from uh, uh, a lineage that, that is part of this species. Very importantly, we need to see the, the characteristics of ancient DNA. So there's this very characteristic damage patterns that we see, which is an increase in cytosine to thymine substitutions at the end of the sequencing reads. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then equally important is that we also want to make sure that when we when we sort of look at how the sequencing reads are distributed across our different species, that they're actually evenly distributed so that they're not just piling up in a particular place where it might be due to you know, some autologous genes between distant related species. So it's not actually uh, th that species that we have here, but rather it's just some some distant relatives and we just have some conserved regions that that sort of draw our reads. And so, yeah, this all this is because we do have uh, different ways here that we can get false positives. So our true positives should have all of these char characteristics. And, you know, there's different ways you can get false positives. You can get stuff from the environment, as I said, some modern microbial DNA. You might get things from, from reagents. Again, that's all modern, so they wouldn't show ancient DNA damage. But you might also get in silico false positives. So, for example, we could misclassify reads from B to A here, and that might actually be quite uh, quite bad because we could get damage in all these things. Uh, but normally, we wouldn't get uh, that close similarity to the reference genome. And in particular, we wouldn't get this even coverage because we expect them to be a bit more stuck uh, the more distant uh, these misclassified species and also database contamination, which is also something we, we have to deal with. Okay, now we applied this to uh, this data set, which is essentially a, a collection of shotgun sequencing data from ancient humans from uh, sort of our last 10 years of work uh, in Copenhagen. So here's just a little distribution of uh, uh, different time slices and, 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 and geographic regions. So you can see it's mainly focused on Eurasia here, on, 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 on the sort of Western Eurasia and the steppe region all the way to Central Asia and Siberia here, because that's where historically a lot of our human work has focused. All in all, it's about 405 billion uh, ancient DNA sequencing rates, and we screen those for uh, pathogens in, around, in 163, sorry, 136 uh, genera that contain at least one species that is a known pathogen based on a recent publication that we used for this. Uh, just to 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 remind you, like this is all metagenomic data. So here's just the way to show how many reads are actually classified for each sample in different uh, uh, bins. So so you can see we have a lot of human DNA in in some of these samples, which you know that's because they were sequenced for human DNA. So uh, we only chose the ones that actually had good human DNA. Uh, and so if we look at non-human, it's actually not that much. Usually that's classified on the vast majority still is, is unclassified. So we don't really know what that DNA is. But nevertheless, we do have basically a lot of data to play with, even though the fraction is small, it's still quite a lot of uh, bacterial, viral, and, 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 and archaeal reads that we can, can look at. OK, authentication. Um, like I said, first thing we want to make sure is that our reads are quite similar to the, or as similar as possible to the reference genome, uh, because that would indicate that that's the actual uh, true species that we're looking at. Uh, and so this is an example of how we can visualize that, which we call an edit distance, where we're just plotting 
the number of mismatches, uh, the distribution of number of mismatches for each mapped reads against uh, different uh, individual reference genome of, of a particular genus, in this case, Yersinia. And all you have to uh, look here is that you can see that, yes, as an example, Yersinia pestis and Yersinia pseudotuberculosis are very, very similar genetically. They're almost 99, I think they're more than 99% identical. Uh, so when you map them against uh, these two, the same reads against these two reference genomes, the distributions almost look the same, but you do see that a slight shift to the left. So you, there's more reads matching, mapping with zero mismatches than with one and two in Yersinia pestis than in Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. So in this particular scenario, we would say, well, it looks like what we have here is actually Yersinia pestis and not Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. Second criterion, and this is really for us the key uh, in the ancient DNA world, is uh, ancient DNA damage. So this is another way, again, to, to visualize that. So this red line here and red crosses indicate uh, the frequency of this uh, ancient DNA-specific uh, substitutions, cytosine to thymine, at the end of the read. So this is just a position from the end of the read. And this kind of U-shaped, if you would go to the other side, at the, at the, at the opposite strand, it goes also up. Uh, so this kind of curve is really what you would expect for true ancient DNA. So we have predominantly damage accumulating at the end of the reads. And uh, my colleagues in Copenhagen have developed this program called Meta Damage, where you can actually then model this damage and get like a nice C-score and, and, and can use that to kind of filter and say, well, this is really strong evidence for ancient DNA damage, as opposed to if this would be completely flat, then we would, would con uh, conclude that this is actually not ancient DNA. This is just modern contamination. And then the last uh, bit is uh, uh, genomic coverage. And here, really what we want is this kind of uh, very even coverage. And then there's different ways uh, how you can get uneven coverage. I'm not going to get into that here. It's uh, like into the details. But you know these kind of scenarios where we have either stacked reads at different parts of the reference genome or non-stacked in the case of not having a lot of reads, but still only in one part of the genome and not sort of randomly distributed, those are essentially bad and, and we we have metrics uh, that we can use to filter those out and make sure that we, we we only get these ones as real hits and this would be false positives. And as an example of that, um, how that looks, so this is uh, two examples. So on the, on the right-hand side here, we have Yersinia pestis. So on the, on the x-axis here, we're plotting the average read depth of a sample. And on the y-axis, we're plotting the, the breadth of coverage. And in Sort of the black line here is the the expected relationship. So if you if if those reads would really come from a, a, this particular species, we would expect uh, uh, the the distribution fall like this. And you can see for Yersinia pestis, you, all the uh, true samples actually fall exactly on the expected distribution. So we're quite confident that these are truly Yersinia pestis reads. This one here probably not because that's the one that falls off. But as a as sort of an opposite example here, toxoplasma is really one case where we do find a lot of hits initially. But if you look at this here, they're all very, very low coverage, uh, very low read depth, and they, they're kind of off this expectation, indicating that those reads are really just sort of stacking in, in, in specific regions of the genome and not actually covering the genome uh, evenly. And so these would be, well, they are certainly false positives. And uh, you can see that more closely, if you look at the samples that actually um, come out as having a, 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 as being positive for for toxoplasma uh, toxoplasma gondii, so when we look at uh, so on the on the y-axis here, these are all individual ancient samples, and and uh, this is sort of a heat map where the color shows how much uh, read depth we have, and on the x-axis, these are the contexts in the genome of toxoplasma gondii that that we actually get coverage in these samples. And what you can see is that this is a very non-random pattern where certain contexts that are usually short, maybe just 800 base pair like this one, uh, draw most of the reads in all samples. And then when you actually go back and look at these contexts and blast them against the NR database, it turns out these are actually human contamination in the toxoplasma genome. And that's a problem because if we would just blindly say, well, this is toxoplasma, we would blindly conclude that we actually have ancient toxoplasma because this is, again, this is data coming from ancient humans. So if we take this Neo43 sample as an example, you can see that it actually has really nice damage pattern. Uh, it really uh, uh, looks like ancient DNA. So we have a you know Z-score of two and it has this nice uh, decay of, of ancient DNA damage. 
But this is because it's the human DNA that actually maps to the contaminating contig and gives us this damage pattern. So you have to be really careful. We really have to be very strict with all these things to make sure that we filter out any possible way uh, to get damage here. Okay. Now, what did we actually find? Just kind of try to, to wrap up this quite quickly now. Uh, this is now updated results that are uh, part of our revision. So that's not in the preprint, but it's it's quite similar overall. So we find a lot. So this is basically just a, a bar plot where you can see for each of these genuses, uh, how many samples do have uh, a positive hit that is authentic ancient DNA from a species in that genome. So you can see you have cases like actinomyces where almost 30% of our samples show at least one ancient um, uh, microbial hit and 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 yeah it just decays here with different so different species have different um, different hit rate but uh, we do find a lot and evidently not all of these can be ancient infections uh, but uh, some of them will be but again if you would just go blindly in and say we have ancient uh, uh, actinomyces whatever you, you know it, it's this what this shows is essentially that if you if you broaden your 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 lens and if you really look at what what is there every sample contains a lot of ancient microbial dna and that comes from different sources but it's just there's a lot of ancient microbial dna so so we have to be really careful with the interpretation of what that actually means we can look at uh, how similar that ancient dna is to the reference genomes and uh, there we see that depending on the species and the genomes it, it varies quite a bit an interesting example here is mycobacterium. So these are a number of samples where we have a hit for mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy. And these tend to be very, very similar to the reference genome, highly similar. Whereas some of these other mycobacterium hits with you know these funny species names are actually quite distinct, quite different. So what we think is going on here when you're at the lower end of, of, of average nucleotide identity, these are probably some environmental ancient uh, uh, mycobacterium species that are in the sample. We just don't have a good match for them in the reference and so these are kind of the closest references we can find for those so those would be what you would call environmental ancient you know you might call it contamination but it's 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 not really contamination per se it is there but it's it's true ancient microbial dna but it's just not the one that we actually interested in why do we see a lot of actinomyces and things like that? Well, a lot of our samples are coming from teeth. Uh, it's about uh, two thirds, I think, because they preserve DNA very well. And so what we're doing here is just looking at which species actually we detect more frequently in teeth uh, and which ones we detect more in like at sort of similar rates in tooth and bone. And if you just look down here at what we detect more frequently in teeth, you can see hopefully that a lot of these are actually oral microbiome, right? So you can see cup, cup no. Pseudophaga gingivalis, uh, Streptococcus mutans, uh, lots of different oral microbiome species that we do actually detect. And so what that actually means is that even though we haven't sampled calculus per se in those, uh, so dental calculus in those two samples, we just take the tooth and drill it out and sequence it. It turns out that we can actually access a lot of oral microbiome through that. And that's actually something we also have some, some more work going on now uh, to, to further characterize that. Okay, now finally, what, what do we find? Well, we find the uh, Yersinia pestis plague. Uh, it would be bad if we couldn't find that because we have we know that this is quite widespread starting from uh, something like 5,000 years ago. So you can see here, this is the distribution, quite widespread in Eurasia. We have our earliest case around 5,400 years ago uh, and then sort of throughout with maybe some, some, some breaks here. So this is just... Uh, to re reassure us that we we actually get what we expect. So this is something that, uh, yeah, we, like I said, it's sort of a positive control. Nevertheless, there's a lot of new cases in here too that we didn't uh, report before. Another one that's super interesting is this uh, the, uh, the bacterium called Borrelia recurrentis, which is uh, the cause of a Lausborn relapsing fever. So it's a Lausborn disease. It's the only Borrelia uh, species that is actually epidemic, can be transmitted between humans through the body louse. So far, there has only been one single medieval genome from uh, uh, Norway. And so now we uh, quite rap dramatically expand uh, the knowledge of what, where and when this bacterium was around. So we find it first around 6,000 years ago. And again, quite widespread uh, across uh, most of Eurasia. Leptospirosis has never been reported through ancient DNA. We find it actually also quite a bit. Uh, interestingly, mainly in Northern Europe, there's one case here in Armenia. 
but uh, also only very recently it starts only uh, like after 2000 years ago so we not find any single case of leptospirosis before that time period so again given that we have so many samples and we know we find other uh, pathogens much earlier you know this makes us quite confident there is something real going on in terms of you know, contrasting uh, these patterns between different diseases uh, and this is an example hepatitis b virus again we have some previous work on that uh, and this is you know, recovering some of those again expanding uh, cases so we have our earliest case here almost 10,000 years ago uh, up in northeastern siberia but again very wide distribution uh, across and then also some uh, cases of plasmodium again a personal interest of mine so we find actually evidence for all three human infecting uh, species uh, starting around 4,000 years ago already uh, in in nine samples in total okay now for the last five minutes or so just want to uh, look at uh, sort of a bit, bit beyond that map making part and really uh, uh, get into what you can do because of the fact that we have this uh, this very nice data set where you know even though they have been samples for human dna and they haven't been um, sort of completely randomly sampled nevertheless you know it's the same method applied to everything it's just shotgun data so it's kind of as close as you can get to sort of a a, a random sample of of eurasian ancient uh, human genetic diversity even though it's not random i have, just have to say that but it's you know as close as you can get at the moment and we just want to know what what are sort of the temporal dynamics of some of those bacteria uh, pathogens that we find a lot and one example here is yersinia pestis again which is one of the ones that we find most and what this shows here is a sort of a bayesian uh, uh, timeline analysis where we where we you know do like a sliding window analysis and then sort of model where uh, the, the the rate of detection of this bacteria through time uh, across all our samples. And as you can see here, it starts around 5,800 uh, years ago where we first detected, then we have quite quite a bit of a, uh, a variation and sort of an increase all the way to 3,000 years ago, and then it drops and we see nothing for 1,000 years. Then there's another blip here, and again, we see nothing for about 1,000 years, and then it goes up again. And if you actually compare that with uh, both published data and what's historically uh, uh, attested, you can see that um, so that the gray dots here is actually plague data from the literature. And you know you can see that they actually line up quite nicely with our data. So, so there's pretty much uh, similar distributions and similar gaps here and here of, of no plague. And then these two bumps here in the end, the first and second pandemic actually show up in our data set. Uh, so this is actually quite interesting because it really would suggest that there was quite a long hiatus here where, where there was not really, uh, at least we cannot detect any humans that have uh, plague infections uh, before the first pandemic and then sort of again after the first pandemic and before the second pandemic. You might still argue that this is due to preservation or whatever, but then, you know, if we look at the Borrelia recurrentis, it's completely, almost completely the opposite picture. So if you look at that time period here from 3000 to 2000, we find a lot of Borrelia, right? It's actually the highest peak. Uh, and so, and again, just one published genome so far, so nothing else to compare. Uh, so clearly, this is not something to do with just differential preservation or, 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 or you know, time periods not well covered. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't detect Borrelia here. So there's really, again, something that, that the power of having all these different uh, species that we can comp compare in the same data set allows us to make this kind of contrasting, uh, this contrast that really I think tell us something real about the dynamics of these pathogens that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And so for the final question, uh, we know there have been these uh, these big transitions. We have documented those over, over many, many years in archaeology, anthropology, and now in, in human uh, in ancient DNA also over the last 10 years, uh, and in Eurasia that really have had this sort of profound impact on, 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 on human history. Uh, cultural change so 9000 years ago roughly starting the transition from mesolithic to neolithic in europe and then 5000 years ago to the bronze age and so one of the questions was what if these transitions were actually accompanied by epidemic transitions like did these changes in lifestyle also sort of increase our, uh, our susceptibility to pathogens maybe because of increased population sizes closer contact to animals all these kind of things and so to to look at that we we, we grouped our uh, species into these different uh, uh, potential source groups. So one of them would be environment. Uh, so these would be things that either can be opportunistic pathogens like Clostridium tetany, 
or that basically just environmental stuff that we pick up from the soil uh, or a microbiome is another category and then we have true infections which are sort of the most interesting of course as our as another category and here we we distinguish into uh, different groups so anthropognotic mainly ones that are transmitted between humans zoonotic through an, uh, mainly through an animal uh, intermediate and then vector borne uh, like borrelia and plasmodium that need a vector to be transmitted Okay, so what happens if we classify them in this case, in, in this way? So this is a, a just a, another timeline again, starting a bit before ten thousand years ago, where we have here sort of the relative rate of how often we detect these different types of pathogens, or not pathogens, these different types of ancient microbial samples in our in our in our data. And so the blue line would be what you would expect if every single category would be detected in at the same rate uh, as we have. Uh, the number of species in in our in our data set. Um, and so you can see that blue, for example, is very high. So we actually find a lot of oral microbiome all throughout. Uh, and that's kind of nice for us because that tells us that we do have power to detect true, authentic, ancient human associated microbial DNA in our data because otherwise we wouldn't see oral microbiome all the way back here. So if you look down here, there's a bit of that red and yellow, so we can zoom into that, and that is really uh, our infection. So it's not that much, but what's what's striking is that you can see uh, the anthropognotic ones, the ones from human to human, we, which are mainly the viruses, we do see a little bit earlier. But if we look at the vector bone and zoonotic ones, they really only start to appear around 6,000 years ago, maybe, and then sort of start to rise. Um, and we can do, again, our modeling with the uh, uh, with the Bayesian timeline analysis, uh, and then it's pretty clear, right? So so we see nothing up until around six five thousand five hundred years ago, maybe when it starts to pick up and then really rises, and that's really when we start to see uh, to detect a lot of these vector borne or zoonotic infections. And what is really nice about this is that it really nicely links to some of the other work that we have recently seen, both from us and from other groups, on um, so the impact of these exposures to infectious diseases uh, on the on the human genome. So we had a study just uh, published in January, where we showed that, uh, that there is uh, the elevated risk for multiple sclerosis seems to have been uh, positively selected for not not the risk for multiple sclerosis, but variants that today confer risk for multiple sclerosis seem to have been selected for uh, in in in, uh, in the European steppe populations in the Bronze Age around five thousand years ago. And so one of the hypotheses there was that really in that particular environment, close contact to animals, they would have given you some some selective advantage, some some uh, adaptive uh, advantage to to uh, um, to help ward off this increased pathogen load. But today, as we don't have these exposures anymore because of hygiene and on all our medical advances, and now in, we see sort of the downside of that sort of hyperactive immune system in that that it also increases our risk for autoimmune diseases. And then there's another paper here from from Luis Quintana Murci's group also came out a little bit before that also showed that actually adaptations to pathogens um, actually started to increase not at the Neolithic but in the post Neolithic Europe, which is exactly the kind of time here when we see an increase. Uh, more and more of 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 these zoonotic and vector-borne um, diseases. So it, it all sort of comes together nicely. So it, it really does look like point towards this this sort of key role of of the, the, the late Neolithic Bronze Age transition and animal husbandry and exposure to animals to driving these this increased exposures to pathogens and also adaptations on the human genomes. And that's, like I said, uh, you can see in, 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 in this preprint that we published, although today what I showed are already the updated results, so hopefully we'll update the preprint very soon too. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, you can you can read much more uh, here. And with that, I think I just want to uh, close with uh, stating that, yeah, I think ancient DNA really is a revolutionary tool to study ancient diseases, and, and we have this kind of lens to go directly into the past now. And we're just scraping the surface. I think we're just getting really, really cool results already. And, and it's just going to get more and more interesting, I think, over time. It's a very exciting time to work uh, in this field. Uh, and I want to thank you. And of course, I want to thank the funders, because this is still very expensive work. We have to do a lot of sequencing. But most of all, I want to thank all my colleagues that were part of this. If you look at all our uh, publications, you can see that there's always sometimes over 100 uh, co-authors involved. You know, from from all different fields, it's very highly interdisciplinary research, um, 
and and a lot of this work has been going on many many years before I actually joined Copenhagen. So I'm I'm, I'm very very uh, glad that I can present uh, all this on behalf of my colleagues and now happy to join the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I see one hand raised. Yeah, I see two hands raised. Uh, Amanda, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thanks. Yeah, and thanks for a really a really great talk. I'm used to thinking about things on the other side of ancient DNA where we just want to get rid of all the contaminants and look at our species <laughs> of interest. So it was cool to see how you're looking at the other side. Um, but on that note, um, I'm really curious about some of the methods that you're using. So there was a slide really early on where you were talking about a particular um, bacteria, maybe it was, um, that looks really similar to human. Um, it was like one of the super, super early slides. Yeah, yeah, this one. And you, and you mentioned yeah. you have to be really careful to make sure that you can, you're actually getting real, like, pathogen yeah. reads as opposed to human reads. So I have kind of two questions related to this. So first, how are you being really careful about that? Yeah. Um, the, the second part of that is, is there a way to do that if you don't know what the contaminant is? So for example, yeah. if you had these reads and we're just mapping to the human genome, you'd get those mapping and you'd be like, these are human reads. Um, so is there a way to tell that they're not human reads without having a database that says it's it's actually more closely related to this pathogen? Yeah. No, this is a very good question, and, and this is this is uh, yeah clearly this is a big a big issue. Um, I think uh, I just wanna yeah I, I skipped a little bit over over the sort of methodological details. So actually the the way we're we're like all the different uh, authentication statistics that we calculate, you know, in principle, uh, we've done simulations as part of the revision now also. Uh, they they would guard you as much as possible against uh, contamination from anything that is whether it's human or nothing and 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 it's precisely the uh, maybe i just go there before uh for for this contamination part it's this these statistics that look at the at the evenness of coverage that we really i mean if you think about contamination i mean in in it we if you if you have a true let's take it the other way around if you don't have contamination, if it's truly coming from the species that that you're interested in, we should really see this completely random distribution of reads across the genome. And and so so we we, we this is one of our key uh, metrics to to uh, to authenticate. Uh, if you have contamination, it shouldn't be randomly distributed across the genome. Hopefully, like there will be some parts right that that uh, the contamination will be incorporated maybe into the assemblies even if it's in the worst case scenario. But in in the in the scenario here for toxoplasma is actually you can see these are actually all contexts that are part of the assembly, but they're very short. They're only like uh, thousand five hundred, a thousand base pairs, and so on. So 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 those when you when you when you calculate then your your coverage statistics and the, your your evenness, they will draw a lot of these stacked reads only in this small part of the genome. The rest of the genome will not have many, and then it will be flagged as as a as a uh, a sample that looks suspicious because of evenness of coverage. Um, what you can also do is, of course, which we haven't done in this case, but what there's a lot of effort now actually currently in, in developing methods to decontaminate databases. So that try to do this before you even start the classification. And we actually have another project going on where we do this for parasites and related genomes, where we actually find, again, a lot of contamination, often from the host species of the parasite. Uh, so this is something again that you can do to 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 clean up your database as much as you can before, but still you, you know you, you can't be completely sure that you can get rid of everything. And that's actually here it's a good example because we do have the human genome in our database here when we do the when we run the initial classification. So these human contexts, these human reads that show up here in these samples are actually human reads that come from regions of the genome that are not in reference genome. So these samples had some additional variation uh, because you know we know there's of course a structural variation in the human genome. Some individuals have extra copies of something. So all this human DNA in this particular case comes from something that is not in what is you know in this case it's Bill 37 reference genome, right? So we already filtered out all the human reads beforehand. 
yet still we get hits that look like human and you know if you wouldn't take care of that you see that they they look ancient because you you our ancient hosts are our ancient dna right um but yeah like i said when we when we look at these are just the summaries of this this coverage statistics so you can see here like we we do have on one hand side much less expected coverage compared to the redev because everything is piling up and not evenly distributed and then we have this other metric, the, this uh, read entropy, uh, which I didn't really get into, read start position entropy, which is really trying to sort out this kind of scenario where you know you don't have piling up of reads because you just have so little of them. But if you actually look at the start positions of the reads, it's still only one part of the genome and not all across the genome. And so there's a way, you know, the, the statistic we devised or that we adapted for this case is, is one of uh, uh, where we look at how the the, so essentially the information content of the start position of the reads. If the information content is high, so entropy uh, is low, then we, we we flag this also as a potential uh, contaminant. And again, in simulations, this works well. Uh, we're also quite confident that it works well based on our empirical results because we do get essentially where we know what we should get back, we, we do get what we what we expect to get back. You know, there might be a handful of cases where we still have some issue, particularly at the low end of the of, of our detection rate, because we, we want to go quite low here. So we sometimes have samples where we just have 50 reads and we say it's a true hit because the damage looks good. Um, you know, in, there might be rare cases where the, this could be caused by, by database contamination. But again, if the damage is there, it can only be contamination of an ancient, uh, another ancient species into it. And it has to have uh, yeah, enough coverage that ancient species to actually show up. So it's it's usually host contamination if you look at, you know, infections of, of a particular species. I hope that's, yeah, roundabout way uh, answered your question. Great, great, thank you. Uh, questions are flying into the chat. There's one from Fernando Gonzalez Candelas. Uh, mm -hmm. Fernando, did you want to ask that? Or shall I read it off? Well, you can read it as you prefer. Yeah, I was wondering whether you have performed any uh, phylogenetic analysis on the ancient genomes and see whether they match the observed number of uh, of uh, identifications with, with through time. I mean, whether the, the the reconstructions from the genome information matches the the demographic. Let's say so. Yeah, I think so. This is something I I, I just mentioned briefly. So so again in in. In most cases here, we actually don't have all that much DNA, you know, coverage of the actual genome. So, uh, if if that is your question, uh, so so when, you know, any if we look here at uh, you know, if we take this uh, Leptospira for an, as an example, you know, neither of none of these individual ancient hits has more than probably 0.1x or 0.2x genomic coverage because of the fact that we have so little data to start with. Um, so we, in, in the vast majority of cases, we don't actually have enough information to do, compare them, you know, in, in terms of, uh, their phylogenetic position to known, uh, variation. Um, hmm. yeah, because that's not really, we don't have enough data for that. Is that, was that, uh, yeah, well, not, not probably with like the spear, but with the, with the other, some of the other pathogens for which you have more. Data, yeah, but that's okay. I mean, I was yeah. No, I mean for plague. I mean, what we did is is basically like plague is sort of the one the best case scenario, right? There we have a really good knowledge of the ancient uh, diversity and of the phylogeny, and uh, we do, you know, we have in our samples a number of some a number of the new samples have sufficient coverage to at least place on the on the on the on the on a reference phylogeny, uh, and. You know, this is actually not. We don't have that type of analysis in the in the in, in this manuscript because we are still working on a lot of those samples. Actually, with in the sort of more classical way of of increasing coverage through capture and trying to really uh, get the uh, a good phylogenetic signal out of them. Um, but you know, whenever we looked at them, they you know all the ones that we detect up here, they are essentially on the on the early parts of the tree, and 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 the ones we detect here that we can't place are actually. Uh, falling within the range of the first pandemic samples, uh, so so at least you know that makes sense in that case. But it it is not part of the of of this particular manuscript. But if you um, again if you look here, it also matches sort of the distribu temporal distribution of the previous published samples. So that's kind of one of the ways we we 
try to address the the sort of the comparison with with previous neon data in a, in a sort of simpler way let's say but we might end up as part of the revisions also include some of these placements for plague to show that these early strains that we have enough coverage really do have uh the expected position in the phylogeny but that's pretty much as as far as we can get with this kind of data like i said in, in the majority of cases we're looking at less than 1x less than 0.5x coverage so we really don't have much data there to compare cool. with yeah, previous one yeah thanks a lot Thank you uh we have a question from cynthia beal cynthia okay i can i can read this out uh have you tried confirming the presence of diseases related to animal husbandry with the archaeological record for animal husbandry at the same site? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, so that's a good. Uh, it's a good point. I mean, we have sort of broadly looked at uh, what whether yeah we what we find makes sense in the context of the, let's say step populations of what sort of uh, uh, livestock they would have had, but um, the. If we go into specific single sites, then you know the then the, the, there's very little. Again, this is sort of aggregating across space and time of 1,300 samples. So, so if you if you want to look at individual sites, we don't really have all that much data of you know, of a particular site. So yeah, that's not something we have done. I mean, it would be super interesting where we have that. What we did look for is uh, we did it sort of the other way around, and we were looking at for for things like uh, um, whether. Uh, brucellosis, for example, was one that we would be very interested in because it's associated with 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 uh, milk and with uh, uh, yeah, in particular also in the context of multiple sclerosis. But that's one of the ones we just don't find. Whether that's due to the fact that it's you know when you're infected you just don't have enough uh, concentration in the blood so we can actually pull it out, or for other reasons we don't know. But it's just one case that we don't find. And actually, that's that's also an interesting thing that I didn't mention. So, so the things we don't find are also very interesting in a sense because we have that kind of internal control. So we don't find mycobacterium tuberculosis, for example. Uh, so that seems to be not very well preserved in teeth, as you might expect, if it's because it's mainly a lung disease. So, so in yeah, all these things sort of nicely work together to make us quite confident that what we find is real. But you know, obviously, we're going to miss a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I think you've partially answered the next question. Uh, Perjon Cardona has asked about have you uh, had any reads for uh, M tuberculosis? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's one case we don't have. So so tuberculosis we didn't find. Uh, cholera we have no information on. Again, not unexpected. But excuse uh, me. You have you you told that you had not only teeth but other bones. So yes. Probably you could find. Uh, I mean. I yeah, mean, we could. It, it's yeah, true, but, but I don't but know. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see. Okay. Because I mean, these 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 bones were actually not sampled. I mean, they're all sampled for yeah. actually. So the thing is, most of the bones are also petrous bones. You know, the ear bone, because all of uh -huh. this data was essentially sampled for human DNA. So we're really not just looking at the at the leftovers okay. of the human DNA. Okay. Uh, okay. And okay. and we've actually ha we have done some work on on you know we had once in a while cases where we had bones with lesions and thing and it's actually really hard to find tuberculosis in ancient bones even when you have sort of presence of... so we haven't really been very successful with it i know there are some there's a few studies that have uh, reported it and and but most of them were also uh, the known cases are also mainly isolated i think from sort of lung tissue and mummified tissue rather than bones i think there was one recent one on bones but it's still but, but you have fine uh, lipare as well yes and that ah interesting that... <laughs> yeah, and that actually from the teeth. again is sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry if it's from the teeth as well. Or I mean... yes, that's from the teeth. Oh, it, I think uh, some of them. I yeah. How well, or maybe from the bones of. Uh, okay. Uh, so I interesting. Think I, I would, I'm not entirely. So I would have to go back and check. There's certainly some teeth. There might be a mix of some teeth and some bone. But it's also another one interesting one. So we have, I think, if an, it's like seven or eight cases here, but it's all just medieval and onwards. So it's again in yeah. line with what we know. So we have we don't find it earlier. Um, but the ones that we do have in this case are actually quite good. So we have a few, even from just from this data, we have a few that are above one X coverage. So uh, and again, it's, we're following up on some of that now. But um, but you know, if leprosy is there, it's actually quite. It seems to have quite high concentration in the or quite quite high amounts in the in the in the, in the bone or teeth. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you very much. Very interesting. Johnny, I've got you on the questions next. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martin. That was really wonderful. You touched on uh, some of the, the questions I'm going to ask here, but I was curious about potential co-infections and also if you're mm -hmm. able to uh, maybe get a, an assumption, is it safe to say if there are high reads or a lot of uh, positive like, proportion, yep. um, is that is that correlated with the cause of death? And is there like confidence yeah. in that? Yeah, I think so. So the first question is we have some examples of core infections. Um, so, so you know, one to sort of uh, qualify that a little bit. One, one issue we have with the way that we're doing this, because that's the way we have to do it, is that we cannot detect, or at least uh, it's it's difficult to do core infections that are part of the same genus, because basically we're just taking you know all the mm -hmm. genus label reads. And we just basically, what we can detect is the majority species of a particular genome. So we, uh, that, that, that is ancient, right? And so, so we, we, you know, there might be some true infections hidden behind that, that are low, low abundance. And there's a higher amount of some environmental ancient, for example, but it also means co-infections we can only have between species, between genera by and large, but we do have cases. I mean, there's one case, a uh, very unfortunate case of, a uh, of, a. Uh, uh, there's a Viking individual that we have previously published that had smallpox that also turned out to have this one of the leprosy cases, actually. So it's both leprosy and smallpox in the same individual. Uh, so there are a few cases like that. It's not it's not a lot. Um, so we don't find, for example, co-infections of many of, if any at all, of if we think of like pestis and, and varelia, which are often actually co-occurring in the same place. Uh, and we find them broadly, but uh, I don't think we have maybe have one individual that has both, but I don't think that we do, uh, which is also an interesting thing. So yeah, so in terms of co-infections, yeah, it's of course something cool to look at, but we, yeah, we need more data, obviously. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I don't think there's, uh, apart from some individual cases. And then the second question in terms of, yeah, like whether it's core, like the load of pathogens and cause of death, um, so we have done a little bit of an analysis to look at what fraction, just in general, like how much bacterial DNA do we have as a as a fraction, as a function of, uh, sorry, how much ancient microbial DNA of a particular heat we have as a function of of just general classified bacterial DNA. So we can see that there's differences. Uh, so not surprisingly, like plague is actually quite high usually. Whereas Borrelia is a bit lower, which is also why we have quite good plague genomes. But Borrelia, we don't have that many because you know it does seem like overall pathogen load might be a bit lower compared to plague. Whether you know it's we can, you know, I guess the the, the broader question is, can we actually say whether these people died from these infections? And I think that's that's kind of the big question that we always get. And I think it's. Yeah, it is difficult to say in yeah. some cases. I think for plague, certainly, for Borrelia, also for this kind of classic, really bad endemic epidemic diseases, I think we can be quite sure that this would have played a, a large, if not the major role in in, in 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 the death of the individual. Also because, you know, we do get a lot for plague sometimes, right? So it has to be, um, uh, uh, there has to be a lot of bacterial DNA in the bloodstream mm -hmm. for us. You know, take out a tooth five thousand years later, sequence it, and, and <laughs> actually able to get a high quality genome. Um, so I think uh, for some of these, we can be quite confident that that was the cause of death. But for many of them, uh, it will be tricky to say. There's also cases, a lot of interesting cases in the environmental pathogens that are uh, like, for example, the Clostridia that are associated with wound infections. We find them a lot, but we don't put them into the ancient infection category because we just can't be sure because they. Uh, likely are coming, you know, they're also associated with decay processes after death. So so probably a lot of the ancient stuff we find is also related to that. So, so you know, that making the link, we, we're sure they're ancient and we're sure they're kind of roughly at the age of when the individual died, but whether it's an, a true infection or whether it's a, uh, a decay process or other things, uh, we, we really only make the link to an infection when we're quite certain given the, the, yeah. the characteristics of the, of the, of the species that it can't just be, yeah, post-mortem, you know, yeah, poses and things like that. Yeah. But that's always that's, the hard part. It's fascinating. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we have reached the, the top of the hour. I think we need to close. I, I wanted 
to thank Martin again, and if you'll join me in, in thanking him for a, a, a fascinating talk and see you again next thank time you. at Club Ev Med. Thank you Thanks so much. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hello. Bye -bye. Thank you.